Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Real Critics, and my Underwater Train Finders. You are the reason why this content remains well-trained. And today, we are going to discuss what is generally officially considered the worst rail disaster in American history. Now, like I said when I talked about the Great Train Wreck of 1918, this one is considered the worst, but they're so close that trying to determine which one was worse is kind of difficult. The max deaths for this one is about 102, whereas the official death toll for the Great Wreck is 101. So you can see why they're neck and neck in terms of being disasters, but they both happen the same year, and they're both terrible. This is the Malbone Street Wreck. Mammon Street Wreck is distinctive, as it actually doesn't involve a typical train setup, as these were subway cars, under control of the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, or BRT. It was a Friday, November 1st, 1918, at approximately 6.42pm. It was the end of the week rush hour, and the train was carrying about 650 passengers. It had just exited from the elevated part of the New York City subway line, and was now in a tunnel beneath Malbone Street, headed towards Prospect Park Station, where the train had to negotiate a rather tricky reverse curve. This is a curve that goes one direction, and then turns back all the way, and goes the other one. It's sometimes called an S-curve, and this section of the track had a set speed limit of only 6 miles per hour, or 10 kilometers per hour. But, when the train entered the tunnel, it's believed that it was going at least 30 miles per hour, or 50 kilometers per hour. Much too fast for this curve. As the train moved along, the back wheels of the first car derailed, and the two cars after it left the tracks completely. They struck the tunnel walls, and their left sides and most of their roofs were torn off. Out of the five-car train, the first and fourth cars were relatively unscathed, and the fifth was completely intact. The second and third, however, were almost completely destroyed. According to the New York Times, passengers were trapped in what could be described as a darkened jungle of steel dust and wood splinters glass shards and iron beams, projecting like bayonets. Due to the location of the accident, it took 45 minutes for rescuers to descend to the site. And since this was in 1918, at the height of the Spanish flu epidemic, the nearest hospital was at capacity, so a makeshift infirmary was created at the nearby Ebbets Field to help those suffering from severe injuries. Out of the 650 passengers on board, possibly 102 were killed in the accident, and 250 people suffered from injuries. So what happened? Why would the train go into the tunnel that quickly? Did the motorman not know that there was a speed limit in that area? Well, to be honest, probably not. There were actually a lot of different causes for this crash and one of them was the motorman's lack of experience. 25-year-old Antonio Edward Luciano was not actually officially a motorman. He'd been hired as a crew dispatcher. But on the morning of November 1st, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers that represented some of the motormen working for the BRT went on strike over issues involving union organization and the discharge from employment of 29 of its members. This caused a sudden shortage of motormen so BRT had to find others to fill the roles. Luciano had been pressed into the role by the company because he had at least some experience moving trains, but he'd never driven a passenger train before, and he wasn't even familiar with the Brighton Beach line where the accident happened. His only experience with trains was parking non-revenue trains in a train yard a year before the accident. Prior to him taking this train out, he had received less than three hours of classroom instruction in being a motorman, and was not officially certified as one either. Which is just nuts to me. I mean, we get more training to get a driver's license in America. This dude was put in charge of a 650-person train after a three-hour course? For reference, at that time, the norm was no fewer than 90 hours of instruction and hands-on training with the subway cars. Luciano's instruction wasn't even close to minimal. And to make it even worse, he was likely emotionally compromised at the time, as just three days before the accident, his daughter had tragically died to the Spanish flu. 
he himself was also recovering from it. The emotional weight of such a thing could have easily impaired a more experienced motorman, let alone someone who was not given proper instruction like Luciano. The train had been improperly coupled together. It had consisted of three powered motor cars and two unpowered trailer cars. The motor cars were twice as heavy as trailer cars, and the trailers were also more top-heavy than motor cars, especially when they had passengers on board. The standard procedure was to avoid coupling two trailer cars together at all by having a single trailer between two motor cars, always. This setup would provide needed stability on lighter trains, but on that train, the two trailer cars had been coupled together, and it was those two cars, numbers 80 and 100, that were in the second and third positions, and sustained the bulk of the damage. And as we already established, a big part of the reason the train derailed was the overwhelming speed. It was doing at least 30 miles per hour when it derailed. Luciano said that he attempted to slow the train, but an investigation of the wreck found that this probably wasn't the case. The emergency brake had not been engaged, and the train's motors hadn't been reversed. Witnesses also stated that the train had not slowed at all approaching or in the S-curve. Prior to the wreck, while Luciano was driving on the route, he had actually overshot multiple stations and had difficulty timing the train's progress and braking accordingly. Though, to be blunt, this was likely more owed to his lack of training as a result of BRT's decision to press him into operating the train when he was neither trained nor licensed. The mayor of New York at the time, John F. Hyland, blamed the BRT and Luciano and company officials were put on trial for manslaughter. Luciano actually testified on his own behalf, and he insisted that he was in control of the train, but that the train did not respond properly. This opposed BRT's own narrative and investigation of the equipment, which showed that the brakes were in good working order and not placed in the emergency application. The trial dragged on until 1921, and all the defendants were actually acquitted, and the charges dropped. BRT, however, did have to pay a significant amount in damages. By 1921, they had paid out a combined $75 million in crash-related liens, and was out of funding to pay anything further. They went into receivership, which ended in 1923, and they were succeeded by BMT, or the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Corporation. BMT was responsible for paying BRT's outstanding claims, and they dispersed a further $1.6 million. The overall operation and standards of the New York City subway system was actually improved after this accident. The old wooden cars that had been involved in the wreck would be slowly phased out over time, and additional safety devices were added to the subway, including speedometers, which believe it or not were not actually in the old cars, headlights, dead man switches, and automatic trackside devices called trippers or train stops that reduce the likelihood of trains operating too fast for conditions. They also added additional signals to warn motormen if they had to slow down or not. And as for Luciano, the man who had no business being a motorman on that day, well, he was acquitted and adopted the name Anthony Lewis to hide his identity. He became a house builder in Queens Village, Queens, and he would later retire to Tucson, Arizona, where he lived till 1985 and died at the age of 91. Truth be told, I can't work up that much anger towards Luciano. He had been forced into the situation by the company. He had been given basically no training. Between losing his daughter and possibly the worry of losing his job on top of that, it's really hard to get mad at him directly. True, he'd made a mistake, but only out of ignorance, not out of apathy. But since he lived a long time, hopefully he found some peace after a while. On November 1st, 2019, officials finally installed a permanent bronze memorial plaque at the northern exit of Prospect Park Station. It serves as a solemn reminder of the worst accident in the New York City subway system's history and what may be the worst accident in American history. A special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Dark Lightning 1536, Master of None, and Josh Johnson. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.